Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being on with us today. I'm Katie Earle. I'm with the Erie County Department of Senior Services, and we're here with Francis Lestingy and super excited to have him back. Thank you for being here, Francis. It's great to be back. Oh, it's always a pleasure working with you. Um, before we get into Francis's presentation, quick housekeeping stuff, which is our usual. We are recording this session, so if all goes as planned, I'll be able to post it on our website, erie.gov slash University Express by the end of this week. If you have any questions or comments while Francis is going through his presentation, please put those in your Q&A panel. So you'll access that on the lower right hand side of your screen. If you're on a computer, you'll see a box with a little question mark. And if you're on a tablet or smartphone, touch your screen. That brings up your control panel. Then you'll see a circle with three dots. Click on that and there you'll have access to your Q&A. So uh, let me introduce the star of our show to you. Francis, so the State University of New York honored Francis is the first professor to receive both the President's and the SUNY Chancellor's Awards for Excellence in Teaching. He was contributing editor for the American Association of Physics Teachers Journal, which is the physics teacher. He's done a lot of wonderful things, but I also want to just highlight here, he's a member of the Board of Trustees of the Society of Gilders, which he'll tell us about, and he's also the co-founder and president of the nonprofit Buffalo Niagara Nikola Tesla Council Incorporated, which I'm sure he'll also mention. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn it over to Francis. And Francis, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much. Well, here we go. We're going to be talking about gold. And you may wonder how I got involved with gold. Well, I learned how to gold leaf when I was in elementary school because a sign artist was kind enough to, to show me. And by the time I was in high school, I was doing, oh, let me see, hold on. <laughs> okay, there, I was doing Book of Kells, illuminated, gilded uh, manuscripts. And then, uh, 28 years ago, I started a company called Signs of Gold, in which we produce <clears throat> what we refer to as uh, hand-carved, gilded sign artistry. And if you want to know what I did between elementary school and 28 years ago, that information is on our website. And um, it's over here in the about, in case you're interested. And also, I am a member of the board of directors of the Society of Gilders, and here's one of their posters. This calligraphy is my own. I do have six calligraphic fonts that are available online. And here is some of our work, the groundhog here and then St. Mark's. So let's talk about gold. What do we do? We admire it, we acquire it, we deal it, we steal it, we beat it, we eat it, we crave it, we save it, we store it, we adore it, we flash it, we stash it, we mine it, we refine it, we use it, we abuse it, we deify it, and today we're going to reify it, which means to make it real and factual. And by the way, that was the closest I'll ever come to doing a rap song. And we're going to go from the glitter to gloom. So uh, toward the end, you will see that, and I hope, uh, you forgive me for that portion of it, but it's reality. So what is gold? Well, what it is not is fool's gold, which is no, known as pyrite, and it's actually an iron sulfide. But this is pure gold and gold is an element and it's number 79. And we'll explain what that number is in just a while. 
It's actually part of all of the elements that we know of on this planet. And the number 79, as I'll, I'll explain in a moment. But let's go back to Democritus in 400 BC, who was the first one recorded that uh, thought about if I have something like a piece of uh, wood, a, a twig, and I start to cut it, when I keep cutting smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, will I get to a point where it's no longer wood? And his conclusion was, no, I will get to a point where there is no more division. And he referred to that as a tamos or uncuttable. Well, we get our word atom from that. And an element in what we refer to as atoms is a substance that cannot be broken down into similar into simpler substances by chemical means. So we have a picture of the atom. We'll see how that came about with the use of gold. This particular picture is incorrect in case you are counting. You can see there are three electrons and they are showing four protons. So this is not a correct version of an atom because it's missing one electron if it's a neutral atom. Now gold has 79 protons in the nucleus and therefore to be neutral has 79 electrons and they're distributed in this fashion here. Now one explanation of why gold glitters so much is that the outer electron is loose and a photon of light can come in and hit it, give it energy, it jumps up to a higher energy level but eventually comes back down. Now that explanation is, is very nice, but uh, it doesn't work because look at these other elements, silver, copper, potassium, sodium, and lithium. They also have that electron up here and it doesn't look like gold. So that explanation is no longer valid if it ever was. So let's, let's see why gold is considered a solidified sunshine. And where did the name come from, first of all? Well, from the Anglo-Saxon geola, we get, which means yellow, we get the word gold, but the Romans had a perfect name for it, aurum, which is shining dawn and the au is the symbol that is used for uh, the element gold now where did gold come from that's a very interesting question and we could ask the same question about anything else. Where did anything come from? Where did we come from? And the answer is that we came from the stars. As Carl Sagan has told us, the cosmos is within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. Well, just how is that possible? Well, let's go back to a little history. We'll go back to Einstein and 1916, when he developed the general theory of relativity. And in that theory, it, he showed that the universe was expanding, but there was no evidence for that. So he, he added a fudge factor, which he called the cosmological constant, that made his universe a steady state, that is, from what they have, had been observing. But a few years later, in 1929, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding. So Einstein had to change that fudge factor and the fact that he had to take it out and the fact that he put it in in the first place 
he said was one of the greatest mistakes of his life. And Edwin Hubble, we'll see more about him and, and the telescope named after him in just a while. But a, um, a, a Catholic priest in Belgium postulated, if the universe is expanding, let's run the movie backwards and everything must have started from a beginning. That was his uh, hypothesis. And there was an opposing hypothesis by the British astronomer, Fred Hoyle. He believed in the steady state theory, in spite of the fact that it was observed that the universe is expanding. And he was very much interested in what's called stellar nucleosynthesis, which simply means stars produce new nuclei. But he actually ridiculed what the priest was saying. And he said, do you mean to tell me this all started with a big bang? And that was his uh, sarcastic description. Nonetheless, that is the word that is still used to describe the beginning of the universe, except that uh, astronomers uh, really refer to it as an inflation rather than a big bang. Of course, there wouldn't be any noise at, in that point at all. If you notice, they've got it uh, explained down to uh, millions of a second to three seconds, and there's particles, and then nuclei, and then atoms, and then stars and galaxies, and we come to us here in 13.8 billion years later. And what all of this has shown us is that stars have life cycles. Our star was born after a nova. Now the word nova uh, means new. And when these stars were observed from Earth, they were referred to as new stars, stella nova. Uh, it is predicted that our star will die not as a nova, but as a red giant, and it will encompass the Earth and certainly uh, Venus and Mercury. We uh, know from physicists that tell us that the sun is producing helium from hydrogen. It's fusing it by what is referred to as thermonuclear fusion. But our star is small. There are stars that are 100 times the size of our star, and they can fuse together from the hydrogen into helium, into carbon, into oxygen, into neon, magnesium, silicon, and iron, and then it stops. And at that point, it begins to collapse on itself due to gravity. And then there is an explosion. And from Earth, we refer to that as a nova. But the novas produce this debris into, the, into space. And that debris from the star is referred to as planetary nebula. And so the cycle of a star goes from a planetary nebula that starts by gravity pulling itself together. But at this point, the elements that were not created up to iron are created. So gold is created and every other element beyond iron is created in this array out here until eventually we get planets and our new sun. So our sun is believed to be a third generation star that formed five billion years ago. And the uh, life cycle is from a stellar no nebula to an average star like ours to a, ultimately a red giant in a planetary nebula, 
and it will die as a white dwarf. If it's a massive star, maybe 10, 20, 30, 100 times the size of our star, it will become a super red giant and then a supernova and ultimately either into a neutron star or a black hole. So here we are on Earth with the elements that have come from a nova. Here's a, a scale drawing of our sun relative to the Earth. Now imagine a sun that is 100 times larger than this. And there are those in our galaxies. So all of these elements we have discovered on Earth, and they start with hydrogen, go to helium, and then on down here. Now, this row here or column is called the noble elements because they do not react with anything. And since nobility doesn't do anything, they name these elements uh, noble gases. But here is iron, and then everything else here was produced in the stellar nebula. And down here we have goal number 79. Now, I've been talking about uh, the protons and the electrons. Uh, let me just go back. Well, we're gonna have to keep moving. So here are the elements uh, that we found on Earth. And in this view, we see various uh, elements uh, in their natural form or so. Uh, there are a few named after people. We're going to see Rutherford. We're going to see um, Bohr. There are two women, Lisa Meitner and Marie Curie. Here's Einstein. And over here is uh, Lawrence. And we're going to see about him. But let's take a look at the elements we're interested in, the precious elements, and of course, gold. Now, you'll notice we have platinum, gold, and mercury. Mercury is an enemy of gold, as I'll show you later uh, in the discussion. So, gold has 79 protons, 79 electrons. It is very dense. As a matter of fact, it's denser than lead. It's 13, well, 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter versus 11.3 for lead. It melts at 1,947 degrees Fahrenheit. And the density can be shown in the following. If you had a cup of gold in a coffee cup, it would weigh 10 pounds. Well, let's look at the properties of gold. Gold, some people thought gold was inert, but it isn't. It, it, does, uh, it does do certain reactions, but it does not oxidize. It is malleable, ductile, conductive, and reflective. Malleable means that it can be hammered to extremely thin layers. Ductile, it can be drawn into wires. Conductive, it's the best conductor of electricity. And reflective, it reflects light extremely well. Now, I'm going to introduce uh, Ernest Lawrence. I mentioned him er before. Um, he had invented a device called a cyclotron, which was actually used to separate isotopes of uranium, and this was all part of the Manhattan Project to produce the atomic bomb. Uh, this is a small version of his cyclotron, and in the Manhattan Project in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, they had this larger version, 
and they needed wires to conduct the electricity in this <clears throat> particular device so that they could get the uranium that they needed. They wanted gold, they asked for gold, and they were told no. So they said, can we have silver? And they asked for the silver, they, they said we need 14, 1,700 tons, and, and they were told, well, we don't even talk of silver in ounces. But nonetheless, they did get the uh, silver to run the machinery. And by the way, the machines, or at least the uh, what was the electronics at the time, all of that was run by women, and they were an important part of the Manhattan Project. So let's look at gold in art through the ages. Here is a painting by the artist Gustav Klimt, and there's a movie that was made about this uh, starring Helen Mirren. It, it's quite a nice movie. You can find it online. It's about the painting that he did that was in her family and was stolen by the Nazis, and she tries to get it back. It's quite an interesting movie. But let's look at art through the <clears throat> ages. Here we see Egyptians and then on or, or on down through the ages. Now, much of this is done with uh, what's called gilding. When electricity came in, then the process of electroplating came in, and we'll discuss that. Here is a modern version of the use of gold. And of course, we have the domes of churches and buildings and statuary. This is in Rockefeller Plaza. And then we have our own statue of Nikola Tesla that we produced. And there you see the gilded uh, lightning bolt that he holds. This was produced by <clears throat> the group. Uh, this is, these are the four of us. We, we uh, refer to ourselves as the Nikola Tesla legacy or rather the Nikola Tesla Council. And gold is also used in furniture, on walls, in frames. And on glass. And here is a tabernacle, it cons was considered the most expensive tabernacle in the world. It was um, gold and then gold plated, and it was encrusted with uh, gems that the people from the Paris donated. And last year, it was stolen. Nobody knows where it is. Then we have the gilded signage that I'm involved with, and th this is some, I'll show you some of the work that I've done. This is a statue I carved of St. Mark and gilded it. And a, a lot of this is uh, work we have done pro bono for various organizations. Including the Marines. So, how is gilding, or what is gilding, first of all? It's the adornment and decoration by the application of gold leaf. And from antiquity to the present, it's still it's achieved entirely by hand. There'll never be a machine that can do gilding. And I want to show you how it's done. But before we do that, I want to deal with this uh, 
phrase that has come down to us from none other than Shakespeare, uh, gilding the lily, which means to add unnecessary ornamentation in an effort to improve something that is already complete, satisfactory, or ideal. It comes from Shakespeare in one of his plays, King John, Act 4, Scene 2, in which the person says, to refine gold, to paint the lily is wasteful and ridiculous ex excess. Well, notice it says refine gold. It doesn't say gild the lily, it says paint the lily, but it came down to us as gilding the lily. And I wanna show you some examples. <clears throat> when I first started, uh, a customer said, I want the, uh, the, our finials to be completely gilded, which I did, and I didn't like. So I found a, uh, an alternative, and that is uh, the customer is always wrong. So this is how we gild our finials today, and they look much classier than fully gilded. Here's an example of uh, gilding the lily and some further examples. Notice everything you see practically is gilded. And in this room, you can see the gilding in the background amazingly. And one more thing, the gilding of this. So, how is gold leaf applied? Well, these are some pictures, or that was, and I'll come back to that. A gold leaf, here it is in a uh, in the leaf, loose leaf form, and it is cut with a knife. Then it is picked up with a gilder's tip, and the gilder's tip is the word that is used is charged, but it isn't uh, electrostatic, it's simply oil. And here is my daughter-in-law showing you what it's like using the natural oils from your skin. And that oil is enough to pick up the gold and then apply it to an area that has been sized and the size is the adhesive for the gold. And here you see examples. And this is some of the work that, that the Society of Gilders did in New Orleans after Katrina. Now, gold leaf comes in various uh, forms. Uh, here you see 24 carats, 23 and a, three quarters, 23 and a half, meaning there's more of other elements in there, like silver and copper. You can go all the way down to uh, white gold, which is 50% gold and 50% silver. Now, the malleability of gold means that it can be made into extremely thin uh, pieces of uh, sil of gold. And to, uh, they are referred to as microns, and a micron is one millionth of a meter. That's hard to imagine. So if a, a micron is actually a thousandth of a millimeter, or 1,000 microns equals one millimeter, but one dime is one millimeter. So here's how you can think of it. If you were to slice this dime into a thousand slices, you would have a micron. And gold leaf can be a hundred times thinner than the human hair and 275 times the th thinner than a piece of paper.
Now, going back to the Egyptians, they were the first to use uh, gold leaf. And what they were doing here was beating the gold or pounding it so that it would become thinner. Later, Michael, uh, rather Leonardo da Vinci invented a gold beating machine. This is his diagram, and this is a reproduction. But today, it's not done that way. In the past, in the uh, 14th, 15th century, this is how they did it. There would be a, um, a furnace. Well, first they would weigh the gold, they'd, they'd melt it. And when it came out, they would use a press in order to thin it out, and then it would be pounded here with the mallet. And then ultimately the ladies would take over and you'll see that that's still done today, that this portion here. Gold leaf production today, I'm, I'm going to deal with one company uh, that is in Florence, Italy, Firen Firenze. And here is uh, some gold being put into the furnace. Uh, some silver in order to make it stronger, but the um, uh, carrot content would, would be reduced. We'll talk about that later. Then it is poured into little nuggets like this that are then put through rollers to make them thinner and thinner and thinner until it becomes ribbon-like. And once it is uh, that thin, they it is cut into one inch squares or so, and then it is pounded. Now, of course, it's not all done by hand anymore, but it's done by machine. And here you see some image of the machine moving around, and there's the uh, the vertical pounding. And ultimately, it comes out from that one square inch to something quite large. Uh, this is about four, five, or six inches. And then it has to be cut into sizes that uh, are conveniently used, which is about three square inches. And here, uh, at least in this company, they don't let the, anybody but the ladies do it because they know they do the finest job. And there's the gold leaf. So that's the uh, Minetti Gold Leaf Company. Now you may ask, why is why is it twenty four carats? Well, the history is this: the weight of gems in the fifteen hundreds hundreds used uh, carob seeds as a unit. So one carob was uh, 0.2 grams. And eventually, the weight of pure gold, the German mark, was uh, 1570. In the 1570s, a mark was 24 carob seeds. Ultimately, the pure standard became 24K. So if you have something that is 24 carats, it's 100% gold. 23.75 which is what we use, it's 99% gold, and the other 25% uh, is uh, copper and silver to make it a little bit stronger. 22 carat is 90%, 18 carat, 75%. One carat would be 42% or 4.2%. 4 All right. Let's talk about the value of gold. <clears throat> J.P. Morgan, whose name we still hear, uh, is still with us. He mentioned gold is money, everything else is credit. Well, as it turns out, this is the value of gold in the last uh, hundred, hundreds of years. In the year 2000, 
And then in the year 2020, the was the highest value of gold per ounce. Today, I checked and it's seven seventeen hundred and twenty five dollars an ounce. And uh, how did that occur? That is the value of gold. Well, it turned out in uh, Florence that we just mentioned and the um, De Medici family, they started banking and it, it came from gold. The way it happened was when people were using gold uh, as a commodity, uh, they would go to a goldsmith who would be making various uh, items for the rich, like uh, goblets and jewelry. And they would let, they would give him the gold and he would give them a receipt. And eventually they would use these receipts instead of going back to the goldsmith. And they, these uh, negotiations took place on a bench and in Italian, the word for bench is banca. And that's where the whole concept of banking started to come in. With the De Medici family, we have uh, Cosimo, Piero, Lorenzo, four of them were popes and uh, they were a very wealthy family. Well, let's talk about the worth of a Nobel Prize. Turns out the Nobel Prize is 175 grams, which is 6.25 ounces. So at today's price, if you won a Nobel Prize and got almost a million dollars in cash, you'd also have $10,781 worth of gold. The Nobel Prize is actually 18 carats alloy, meaning there's some silver in there and a 24 karat gold plate. But before 1980, the metal was solid 23 karat gold, which means it was extremely valuable. And <clears throat> here we have three Nobel Prize winners that when the gold was uh, much more valuable or the metal was much more valuable, uh, they were going to join the Manhattan Project in uh, New York, and they had their Nobel Prizes. And Niels Bohr was in Denmark, and he was going to come later. So they asked him to take his uh, to take their gold medals and do what they knew he could do with them, and that is to use aqua regia which is a combination of nitric and hydrochloric acid, which would dissolve the gold, as you see in this, these photos here. This is actually the, um, the formulation. You can see here that it becomes gold chloride. So what they did, or what Niels Bohr did was to dissolve the, the metals, put them in a uh, in a beaker, and the Nazi when the Nazis came in, they didn't know any better. And after the war, the uh, the gold was re reinstituted, and it was recast. Well, speaking of metals, let's look at the gold medals in the Olympics. Uh, every country can design its gold medal as it chooses, but it has to have the right amount of gold. This is the uh, Olympiad of Berlin when Hitler was involved. There is six grams of gold. So we have the various metals and the various metals, the bronze metal, is mostly copper, a little bit of uh, zinc and tin. The gold medal 
I'm sorry, the silver metal is mostly silver. And the gold metal is mostly silver as well. It has 1.3% of gold. And if you wanted to know what the value of these are, the gold medal is $387, silver medal is $194, and the bronze medal is worth $5. What about the wonderful Oscar? Well, the Oscar is 13 and a half inches high. It weighs eight and a half pounds. And if you want to know something that heavy, uh, if you pick up a gallon of milk, that's about eight pounds. So that's what the, these people are uh, swinging around when they thank their mother and everybody else. The Oscar is made up of 93% tin, I guess, because it's from Tinseltown, 5% antimony, 2% copper, and the gold is three, uh, 0.38 micro, uh, microns. That means if you have your dime and you cut it into a thousand pieces and then take one of those pieces and cut it into a, th a three and you use one of those, that's how much gold is on the Oscar. Remember the human hair is about 75 microns. So how much does it cost for an Oscar? Well, to make it costs $400, but the cost of the gold in one Oscar is $58. And if you wanna know what happened to Michael Moore's Oscar, you can ask me later if we have time. It's an interesting story. We mentioned electroplating. This varies from uh, less than one to five microns. And essentially it's a uh, electrochemical reaction. You have pure gold here. You have, if you wanted to gild a key, you have that here and you have an electrical uh, system here of a battery and electricity will run through and there's an electrolyte here. Ultimately, the gold will be plated out as you can see here. And these are examples of gold plating. And if you have one of these, you certainly want one of these. And if you have one of these, you want one of these. Where is gold used in industry? Well, 20% of the earth's gold is used in industry. It can be beaten so thin you can see through it and astronauts have a coating on their visors. And there's a building in Toronto It's called the Royal Bank Plaza in Toronto. It has 14,000 windows with $3.3 million in gold coating them. I mentioned about the conductivity and we see gold in various electronics. Even the iPhone has 50 cents worth of gold, but there are millions of iPhones costing about a billion dollars in gold or 25 tons. Okay, uh, I see by the time, uh, I'm gonna skip by this segment here, but very quickly just to say that gold was used uh, 0.6 microns in an experiment that discovered or hypothesized the nuclear atom. They thought the uh, alpha rays would go right through this 
model that they had thought of and some of them came back so they had to say that there is a a dense nucleus and we got our nuclear atom that way um i'm going to skip by this because gold was used in nuclear weapons and is used in nuclear weapons but I want to get to gold in bling. 65% of the Earth's gold is used in this. And notice, uh, this is a dispensary, gold to go. You put in some cash and out comes gold. Of course, this is in Saudi Arabia. And you can buy various coins of gold. Here's an example of somebody who bought some gold it's 250,000 grams. Well, that is equal to 550 ton, uh, pounds, which is very difficult to move around. It's 8,800 8, ounces. So at today's price, this piece of gold is worth $15,180,000. And what would you do with this? It would just have to sit there and you'd look at it. It is owned by some Chinese oligarch. But here is the real bling. And we're all familiar with this. Sixty-five percent of all the gold in the world is used for jewelry. Now, you might uh, notice something here that uh, the Indian culture makes use of gold in, in their weddings and 80, 800 tons of gold per year are used. And it's 20% of the world's supply. But then, of course, we have the use of bling elsewhere and in beauty. Here's uh, DeFranco doing something strange with gold. And don't forget the gold dresses. I want to go back to the um, Olympics. You see this guy or these people biting their medals. Why? Because somebody told them that gold is soft. And that's true. But that is made principally of silver, as we showed you before. Here's a little tiny piece of gold, which can be bent very easily, or you can bite on it. But here is somebody biting on gold and is actually eating it. Uh, can you eat gold? Well, there is a place in New York City called Serendipity 3, in which they have a golden opulence Sunday. And I want to describe that for you. It's a little uh, groovy store called Serendipity 3. There was a movie made with uh, John Cusack. It's also online, a cute uh, romantic comedy in which they meet at Serendipity. But what they sell is this $1,000 Sunday that comes with all kinds of uh, extras and if you want to know what they are, I can tell you that at the end. But it's a little, it's a tiny restaurant. And they serve more than the $1,000 arrangement. Uh, <clears throat> one day this uh, sheik came in. His name was Sheik uh, Prince Mohammed bin Mega Bags uh, Mullah with his... Um, eight wives and um, eight bodyguards. And he ordered one of these $1,000 Sundays. And when he was told that the, the goblet, which is a Bergdorf Goodman goblet worth $350, he said, if I knew that, I would have ordered one for each for each of my wives. 
but he did better than that back in Dubai. He had them open a serendipity there. And ironically, with all this money and cash and gold going around, this restaurant, Serendipity 3, was known for selling the world's, uh, world's priciest dessert, illegally underpaid its staff. But nonetheless, people continued to eat gold for some reason. And this little bottle, very tiny bottle, is $100. And the one thing that you have to be careful of is not to eat any gold that has copper in it, because that's not uh, good for one. Now, gold in reserve, 15% of the, girl, the world's gold is in reserve. And in spite of this, uh, mixed message here, welcome to Fort Knox with a tank in front of it. Uh, the fact is nobody's welcome there. The first person to visit, uh, the first uh, private citizen to visit Fort Knox in, in the last two decades was the former Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Steve Mnuchin. He wanted to look at the gold because he liked such a thing. He was allowed to do it because he was the Secretary of the Treasury. Now, this was instituted at the beginning of World War II, and the gold reserves at Fort Knox amount to uh, 5,088 tons of gold. There's another depository of gold, the United States Mint at West Point, New York. And in there, there's uh, still over a thousand dollars worth of gold. In New York City, there is a reserve. It's the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, erected in 1922. And <clears throat> World War II caused people to send their gold to this reserve, and it is down 16 stories below. There's 6,700 tons. Uh, the United States only has 2% of that because much of that is from Europe. And here's the departed Queen Elizabeth and her husband visiting and checking over her stash. Now, there is an organization called the World Gold Council, and they estimated that all the gold ever produced could fit under the Eiffel Tower in a cube that would be 66 feet. It would be 187,000 tons worth $8.2 trillion, and all of it has been produced since 1950. Now, we talked about the value of gold. What about the cost of gold? Well, gold has to be mined, and that's the cost. Uh, uh, I am going to go through this rather rapidly because I see time is getting close. So, here we see uh, the mining of gold, of panhandling all over the world. Now you you can bet these people are not doing it for their for themselves. They're being paid a paltry sum to be given to some uh, corporation. Now there is something called uh, hydro mining, which isn't really done much anymore. The Romans did it here in Spain, 
<clears throat> Las Madulas, and they would bring water in and then um, <clears throat> make gold. This, these pictures are actual photos of gold that I photographed from a, an exhibit in Toronto. They must be pure gold because it certainly wasn't electroplated. But here's what they would do. They would simply use high pressure water and ultimately get, separate the gold out. There's other kinds of mining called hard rock. There's tunneling an open pit. And you can see here <clears throat> when they got a huge amount of this, this was called load gold, and then they refer to this as the mother load. And I'm going to go through these rather rapidly. Oh, uh, I should tell you that what they do is they go straight down and across or go at an angle and across. And so we're into the mining of gold. Now notice, here's an example of going down one mile, two miles, and then going horizontally. Now that's going so deep that the temperature of the earth is very high there, they can't bring air conditioning down. So what they do is they have a plant up above that produces ice and they bring the ice down and then they blow fans over the ice for these workers. The deepest mine is in uh, Panyang, South Africa. And here you see all kinds of uh, work. Now, the open pit mining is also done around the world, especially in uh, South Africa. The size of this equipment, look at the car uh, and look at the wheel on this, the tire. This is about 11 feet high. The price of these uh, trucks is $5 million. Here's what those, here's what they do with open pit mining. It, it's just unbelievable to see. Here's almost two miles across. And this is an example of a, a landslide. And look at the city right next to this open pit that goes down who knows how far. Now, once the gold is mined, it has to be purified. There are two methods, amalgamation and cyanidation. So what they have to do with the, uh, the stone is to pulverize it and then they mix it with mercury. And as I mentioned, mercury is kind of an enemy of gold. And the next picture shows you a, <clears throat> what a, a piece of gold leaf does on some mercury and eventually it just engulfs it. All right, I won't go through that. And now the cyanide, the cyanidation uses cyanide and the production of cyanide across the world is mostly going to refining of gold. But in all of this, we have waste. The Eiffel Tower weighs 10,100 tons. Every four sec 42 seconds, gold mining produces the weight of the Eiffel Tower in waste tailings. So, in less than five days, one could cover the entire city of Paris 
with gold tailings, waste towers. There's an immense amount, but you should remember one thing. 20 tons of earth are mined in order to produce one ounce of gold. And here are some examples. Um, I'm going to make a comparison between gold tailings and uranium. This is uranium, which what they do is they either bury it or they put it into an embankment. But invariably, the embankments break and you have contamination. But here's what they do with uh, gold tailings. And of course, there's opposition to this. Groups call themselves uh, no dirty gold. The more you know, the less gold glows. Roses are red, cyanide is blue, dirty gold is no way to say, I love you. Okay, so I want to say some final words on gold. You have defiled, r ravished, and desecrated me, all for the ephemeral shimmer of glitter, and that was told to us by Mother Earth. Einstein has said, Two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. We've seen beauty, elegance, grandeur, sublimity, decadence, indulgence, opulence, grandiosity, affectation, pomposity, bloom, destruction, devastation, contamination, desecration. We need some optimism now. And that is Tokyo's Olympics made their medals from eight to 80,000 tons of recycled cell phones, which is a great thing. And I am told that the a company in Florence, Italy, uses only recycled gold. And we have the new Webb, James Webb Space Telescope, which uses gold. It is a million miles away from the sun. It's 21 feet in diameter compared to the Hubble Telescope and it uses gold to give us what will be even more dramatic pictures. And we'll look into the past. And speaking of looking into the past, there's a gold recording on Voyager 1 and 2 and from 1997, well beyond our solar system. And on it are the voices of people of Earth and the, the music and the sounds of the Earth. <clears throat> and in the music, there were the four Bs, uh, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, and Berry, Chuck Berry. And we're gonna end with Plato's statement, all the gold which is under or upon the Earth is not enough to give in exchange for virtue. Thank you for this golden opportunity. Francis, thank you so much for another amazing class. <laughs> oh, you're most welcome. I hope it was really are. shining. Yeah. <laughs> um, people did enjoy it. I think we have some questions and comments in the Q and A, so I'll get to those. Um, okay. Now we're a little over time here. Do you have a couple more minutes for us? Oh, I do. Yes, I hope everybody okay. else does. Perfect. All right. So um, the first comment I'm seeing is seeing the periodic table of elements brought me back to high school. <laughs> <laughs> 
Good. I agree with that. I'm seeing, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Um, we have somebody who's wondering, how does white gold fit in here? Well, white gold is 50% gold, 50% silver. So the, the, the silver sort of predominates. <clears throat> when you have something that's white gold, you're not going to see it as gold, but it, it does have 50% gold in it. Okay, awesome. Never knew that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah. I'm seeing this was a very thorough presentation. I appreciate your time. And we have somebody who's wondering what happened to Michael Moore's Oscar. Oh, great. Let me, uh, <clears throat> I have a prepared answer for that. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I figured you would, Francis. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Michael Moore won the Academy Award for uh, bow bowling for Columbine, and he he was he received it five days after uh, the Bush administration had attacked uh, Iraq, uh, claiming that they were responsible for nine eleven, and so. Um, he started to what he did is he went up to the stage and he asked all of his um, com, not competitors but comrades who who uh, were in the documentary category he asked them to come up and he said uh, what we do is we tell the truth and he said we are not being told the truth about this war and he was booed and he was uh, the, the music started to get him off the stage and when he went backstage, the uh, stagehands surrounded him, and one of them came up to his face and said, you are an a-hole. And they were, he was going to smack him, but uh, the others prevented this guy from smacking my, Michael Moore. So that night when he uh, packed to go back home to uh, Michigan, uh, he put the Oscar in towels, wrapped it in his suitcase. And when he got home, he opened the suitcase and there was a note that said that the uh, um, the investigation committee, I forgot the name of them uh, at the airport, um, that they investigated it. So he he opened the towel and the Oscar was scratched and desecrated beyond belief. And um, that was because he had spoken against the war. Then years later, um, he was at a television show and the man that had called him an a-hole was one of the technicians. And he went up to him and he said, you know, I'm the one that said that to you. And he said, I was wrong, you were right. And he hugged them and everything ended nicely. But his Oscar was ruined and never replaced. Oh, interesting. Thanks for sharing that story with us, Francis. Yeah, and if you want some information about the Oscars, you're not allowed to sell it, but you can sell it back to the Academy for $1. But once the person is dead, then it can be sold and the Gone with the Wind Oscar was bought by Michael Jackson for two, uh, $2,900,000. And here you see some of the other Oscars that were uh, put on auction after the people died. Any other questions? I'm not seeing anything that's coming through yet. We'll just give it a second here. Uh, if I may make a comment, I thought the information about the gold medals at the Olympics was really fascinating. I like <laughs> that you mentioned that. Thank yeah. you. Good. Good. Just wait another second here. Now I'm just seeing a couple thank yous. Thanks for a great presentation. And uh, yeah, so Francis, thank you very much for your time today. Everyone who's on, we appreciate you. 
and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay, great. It was a pleasure.